Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot. Where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Welcome home, Brains. There's only one requirement to hang out on the edge, is that you open your big brain and close your small mind. Did you bring your thinking caps? It's time to put them on, because the conversation starts So we do it hot and heavy right here on the edge the place where the conversation is pointed boom guests are sharp bam and the responses are never dull bing bang boom 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 so welcome everybody i'm in a super good mood you know why because i've got kathy ozakovic from australia now you know she roams around a little bit she's kind of a nomad but i dig that but she eats healthy you know <laughs> That's important. I don't care where you are. You can eat off the land. You can eat healthy. Uh, she's a wellness coach, dietitian, health coach. She does NLP. That's Neuro Linguistic Programming. She's a practitioner. She works with gut health and uses lifestyle as her medicine. Well, that's a novel idea because I'm right in the thralls of it. So I've got my pencil and paper handy so that I can uh, kick up my game and take full advantage of our interview today with Kathy Ozakovich. How are you, Kathy? I'm very well. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. Oh, you are more than welcome. You're doing the most. <laughs> That's what we say. You are living your best life. And that smile is infectious. Oh my God. <laughs> did your parents pay a lot of money for those teeth or did they come naturally? Actually, they came naturally. I have one crooked tooth on the bottom, which you can't see when I smile, so I don't mind it at all. I'm very blessed. And just a fun fact that I learned not long ago through all the reading and the research that I do, being a nose breather actually helps keep your teeth straight. So I must have been a nose breather as a child. Really? A nose breather? And, and not a thumb sucker, because if you're a thumb sucker, boy, your teeth are jacked up exactly no but it's a coping and a comforting mechanism i get that too but absolutely a, but at a certain age you would seem like you'd be able to wean them off the binky or off the thumb but you know again to each its own and you know what april that's a great segue into my belief and what i see is that our relationship with food is often a symptom of what is actually going on underneath so how we eat and everything that we're experiencing there's something underlying that behavior something deeper well you know we're gonna go into that we're gonna get into that real deep because um my friend asked me she said are you eating for entertainment <laughs> i thought that was so amusing because sometimes you are you know i'm yep. sitting here at my desk and i have blue chips with their healthy but you don't eat the whole damn bag <laughs> <laughs> you know so it's moderation how did you find yourself in this health space I found myself in this health space through my own struggle at the age of 16 I went on my first diet and I restricted and I got down to a very light and skinny 40 kilos and I was skin and bone because I'm quite tall. Now I don't know how to convert that into pounds. And Well, I, well go right ahead and keep talking and I'll Google it. <laughs> so I'm 170 centimeters tall. I was 40 kilos and I was going to school eating one egg a day. And this was my form of control. There was a lot going on behind the scenes in my family. And I decided to control what I could, which was what I eat and my grades. I was still getting straight A's over 90%, sometimes eating one egg a day. And that took me on this journey where I lost weight. And when mum noticed, she panicked, took me to a doctor who referred me to a dietitian. In these humble beginnings of my healing journey, I did not think that one day I would go down that path myself. I mean, uh, wait a minute. I was skin and bone. Oh, mum didn't that notice. was, that, I just converted that brains 40 kilos. She was 88 pounds on 170 centimeters tall that's quite tall as well wow 
That's what they called in the, the early 80s when the supermodels had to be like. <laughs> yeah, I was like a zero. Yeah. I was, I was, I was a zero. They say, oh, she's just heroin chic. <laughs> I was a zero, a two, something like that in terms of US sizes. Skin and bone. Mum noticed when it was time to go to the beach and took me to a doctor who referred me to a dietitian. And that began my journey of understanding food as fuel and how I can actually use food to perform better in life and at school. So I started reading more and understanding more. And it wasn't a linear journey, absolutely not. But during year 11 and 12, my healing, I kept coming to school with facts about food. So with my one best friend at the time, I would share what I learned. And by the end of year 12, she basically said, Kathy, you know so much about food already. Why don't you just study dietetics? At that time, even though I was sitting across from a dietitian, I did not know what dietetics was. Mm. I hadn't connected the two. So that was the beginning of my healing journey and the journey of coming to wellness because dietetics is very different to what I do now. Okay. And I well, see. Well, well, dial back, slow down. Tell <laughs> us what is defined dietetics for us. Yep, I'll tell you. So, to become a dietitian, I went to uni, I studied for four years, and after that, I worked in the hospital setting, I worked on the wards. I helped manage disease. So the way that I think of a dietitian is they are a doctor for food. So they are the doctors in hospital, left or right hand, when it comes to food. So we're managing symptoms. We're helping people in acute situations. We're the people that actually write the uh, regime for um, nasogastric feeds or total peripheral nutrition, um, people who are on dialysis, kidney machines, right? So dietitians are on the wards helping manage malnutrition. Okay, now separate that from a nutritionist. So nutritionists actually do not have the qualifications, and this is by Australian standards, not sure if the US is the same. Nutritionists are actually one level lower, and they can't work in hospitals they don't have the clinical knowledge that a dietitian has ah, okay so I, I i have the clinical knowledge to understand how diet impacts and can lead to diseases and what kind of a diet helps manage disease well that is absolutely phenomenal and bravo to you so you, you are not only good with that you've lived it you have overcome it so you can really talk authentically to the situation, to the person that is obese. Absolutely. The person that is, you know, suffering with an eating disorder. Again, it's psychological, but let's get into some of the real deal, Kathy, because let me tell you some of my challenges, girl. Consistency. Consistency is key. <laughs> but you know what I, I did? I, I had a conversation with myself. I did some mirror work a few weeks ago. I said, you know what, April, you keep a promise to everybody else, what you're going to do, where you're going to be, how you're going to show up. But are you showing up for yourself? Mm -hmm. Are you going to really just kind of, not for anybody else, but for health reasons, and just to see if you could do it. I call it a live it. Mm -hmm. So the vernacular, as you will talk about in a minute, is neuro-linguistic programming. How you talk to yourself is very important. And girl, mm -hmm. I had a heavy conversation to the point I started to cry. So I said, okay, so what are you going to do about it, April? I said, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at it. Years ago, I wrote myself a letter to my money because I was in financial problems. And this is about 15, 20 years ago. Since then, I've been financially free because I faced the demon. Yes. I looked it head on. And that's what I'm doing with this food thing. And let me tell you, uh, I am in awe of where my cholesterol is coming from where my sugar is where I really thought my sugar was crazy. The sugar, the carbs aren't that bad as the total calories. It's kind of fun because at the end of it, I look and I see where I was a week ago. It was lousy. 
This week is a little bit better, but next week's going to be spectacular because I can go back. I've got a pattern to see what worked and what didn't. I'm sorry. I'm just rambling on, but I'm so excited, Kathy. I love this, April. And I really want to honor you for doing that mirror work and for having that tough conversation with yourself because awareness is the first step and so many people avoid it and so many people are not ready for it and it's hard and that's being anorexic and going on the healing journey it wasn't linear and the one thing that they don't tell you when you starve yourself so much is your body's going to want more food now that you're feeding yourself and you're going to go the other way mm. because the pendulum has swung we swung to one extreme now we're going to swing to the other extreme so I went from under eating to overeating so I can appreciate binge eating disorder the cycle of restricting and then punishing yourself when you overeat and then getting stuck in that mindset as well right it doesn't and being just honest affect your, but and be anorexia from what i i hear uh it doesn't just affect your eating it's me, you know your mental capacity uh your um you know your, your skin how it looks, mm -hmm. your bowel movements. I mean, mm -hmm. your organs, it can really do a number on you if you let it get out of control. And there's so many different ways that people perform this anorexia. Uh, I had a, a, a friend of mine's daughter rushed her to the hospital, eating disorder. They put her in a, you know, in a, a psychiatric ward just to maintain and see what was going on. And he denied every which way he could that she didn't have one, I would know. And I said, well, this is something that you keep a secret. Did you keep yours a secret? So I definitely agree that we talk about the things that we are most proud of. And when we're not proud of something, we tend to hide it, right? And this is, again, a mindset shift that happened over the years for me is that shame grows in the shadows. Once we shine light on that shame, it can no longer grow and we can actually do something about it. And that's the awareness part, right? When we become aware of our shadows and we welcome them, we can actually change what we don't like. I didn't... I guess I hit it in the beginning because I was wearing baggy clothes and I was feeding the dog, the, the lunches, right? And I got to a certain point where like mom noticed me and I gave that cry for help. Like, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know, I don't, but this is not where I want to be. Okay, wait, um, wait, 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 let me dial back. Let me dial back. Cause you said, this is not what you were doing now. And I'm just trying to frame a mindset. Yours is very individualized. Everybody else is specific. But did you, what was that headspace? I mean, you knew that you were doing this for a reason. Did you, did not like the way that your body looked? Were you yes. depressed? Did you, you know, what, what was, what was running through your brain? What was going yes. on in those two years? So just to clarify, I, when I got to that point, I knew what I was doing. I was very conscious of the fact that I was restricting myself. And at one point where that change occurred was, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to heal. I want to get better. But that, well, the journey began with me actually growing into a woman and I saw myself gaining weight and I didn't understand that my body would go through these changes. How so there was, about? I was... My body image complexity started very young. Um, like I said, at 16 years old was when I went on my first diet. However, at the age of about 13, I noticed that I wasn't growing any breast tissue compared to girls my age at school. So I was very aware. Did that make you feel any kind of way? Absolutely. I had that conversation with my best friend and I said, your boobs are growing, mine are not what's going on <laughs> really oh I absolutely know. I, I was in year know. seven I was I in year know. seven and but you know what it affects your mency too you know well, this girls, is girls, are, girls are having it at 10 years old versus where you know it was about 13 you know 14 you know and I developed very naturally and very normally absolutely I got my period at on time for me I was 14 years old so my breast tissue just didn't grow because I was very athletic. Mm -hmm. I was a runner and I was very lean. 
And my mum also always used to tell me I never had breast tissue until I had my first baby. Just wait, just wait. But I always felt uncomfortable in my own skin. I always felt uncomfortable walking into the lingerie area with my mum. I always felt that I was missing out. I even got teased at the beach sometimes as well. And that really stuck with me. And then when I actually started growing into a woman and started getting a bit chubby because I didn't understand what was going on with my hormones, I saw myself as chubby Mm. and my friends started going on diets and I was like, hang on a minute, if they're all losing weight and going on diets, well, I don't want to be the chubby one in the group. I was always the lean athletic one. So I need to go on a diet. But the problem, or the problem, the challenge, or even it's a blessing in disguise for me, my mindset is it's you against you. They were all dropping off and not dieting anymore because it's hard, whereas I took it to the extreme. I've always had straight A's. I've always been very organised. I've always known where my things go. So this dieting, what it became a game for me, it became a challenge for me. How can I take it further, mm. right? So that's where I went into that mindset and just well, again, restricted. Like I said, it's I'm looking at it and I'm charting it. And again, Brains, I know you probably think that is so annoying, but I recommend that you go to MyFitnessPal, altogether, MyFitnessPal.com for free. It tracks your cholesterol, your carbs, your carbohydrates, your protein, your sodium, your sugar. Uh, and then you can put it and they have everything you think you could eat from the big box stores to something that's homemade. And it's so important to look at it. Yes. So yeah, yeah, you're absolutely yes. right about that. Absolutely right. And it is fun. It's a game because now I'm chasing the number. I'm like, oh, okay, well, how can I stay at this number? Because if I stay at this number, okay, it's not about the number either though, Brains. Mm-hmm. I don't want to confuse. I don't want to confuse the issue because it is fun. But yeah. after you get beyond the bloat, after you get beyond the inflammation. I was looking at one of your videos and I want to say kudos to you for what you did with your daddy. Thank you so much. Now that may not be, that may not work for everyone, you know, and I, I keep it 100. They've got all of these weight loss injections now that people are clamoring for here in the United States that your insurance won't cover, but yet and still you're more of a high risk because you have you know, obesity or diabetes or high blood pressure. When you get past 40, everybody's got something, Kathy. Only if you want to. That's my belief. Well, gosh, now we're all organic. We're going to expire. So, you know, some of the roots and some of the leaves are going to fall now. Absolutely. I agree that we're all aging and we can age gracefully. And this is why we have outliers and a mindset that, I created is also over time through reading and stuff is actually looking at well all of our research is based on averages and these averages actually ignore the outliers because it skews the results so much but what are those outliers doing so if we have an average life expectancy of 83 in Australia yet we know that there are outliers that are living 95 100 years what are they doing to keep going. Well, let me tell you, I was at a conference with one of the doctors that did the, um, oh goodness, the blue zone. Mm -hmm. And he went to the five blue zones in around the world where people live to be centurions. And Mm -hmm. he looked at what went on. And some of the things I found very fascinating when it came to longevity is a sense of community. Yes. You have to interact with people, uh, yes. walking, working in the garden, mm-hmm. Japanese sweet potatoes, mm-hmm. eating fresh food. And these centurions, a lot of them don't even wear eyeglasses, yes. everything. But you know what? And I'll keep it real. I don't know how true I could follow that, even if I tried. Number one, because our food source is not farm to table. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. There's only so, hey, I'm a city girl. There's only so much I'm going to (laughs) grow in the backyard. I agree. So that's fine. Okay, then the supplement market, that's big business. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, there's people that have to have restricted diets. They talk about this intermittent fasting. 
Well, if you're a diabetic, you can't do that. So see, that's why we have to work with a trained professional because you are going to dot all of our I's and cross our T's. So can Absolutely. you give us a few great takeaways for the person that is, you know, struggling, but wants to stay consistent? Absolutely, April. And some of the things that you said there, there are some limiting beliefs in there because that we have a vast variety of information out there. For example, there is credit to fasting and we know that fasting helps the gut microbiome. How long we fast for will depend on the individual. Even people with type 2 diabetes can benefit from fasting. It is knowing how to do it, when to do it, working with a professional to understand the blood sugar levels and what's going on. One of the things that really gets to me as well, I'm just going to mention this. They're still teaching in textbooks that type 2 diabetes is not reversible and that you cannot achieve remission. The research is catching up now and people are starting to speak out. We can achieve remission of type 2 diabetes. So it is reversible. And there are many other diseases that the research is catching up and we're starting to talk more and more about the innate ability of the human body to heal itself. Give the body what it needs and it will work for you. And in giving the body what it needs, I want to bring it to the six pillars to wellness that I always bring it back to. The six pillars to wellness to help you maintain and achieve your level of best wellness. They are nutrition, movement, sleep, optimizing the stress response, light therapy, and mindset or spirituality. I will adjust this depending on what the client resonates with, whether it's more mindset or whether it's more spirituality. And there are re there's research across all six of these pillars that actually it's, it's scientifically proven that these things help us optimize our hormones and optimize our health. And there are fundamentals and foundations, those blue zones, when we look at them, there are fundamentals that are the same. So when I talk about nutrition, it's all about real food. It's all about something that real food is something that grows on a tree, grows in the ground, grows on a bush, was once swimming or running around. It's about gut health. All the research is showing us now, the research is catching up on what we kind of knew, is gut health what we eat is what we become. Everything you eat becomes part of you. And those gut bugs known as probiotics, gut bacteria, they are actually eating the food that you're eating. So you're feeding yourself, but you're feeding them. And what you feed them will determine what kind of a health outcomes you're going to have because they produce the chemicals that are going to keep you healthy. Mm -hmm. So now we're looking at gut health and we're looking at, well, how do we optimize gut health? Gut health is actually optimized through the six pillars to wellness. All of those six that I listed, they impact your gut bugs because we're 90% bacteria and 10% human. So we need to learn how to help them thrive so that we get I always the say that. Uh, I say, when someone annoys me, I'll say, and that's just a breeding, uh, breeding ground for bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> literally, literally, we're just hosts. So let's mm -hmm. actually make sure that they're eating the the best that they can to give us the outcomes that we want. And that's the alignment part, right? April, what you were talking about there, aligning yourself with what you want. If you want the best health outcomes, are you doing the things that are going to give you the best health outcomes? And what can you do today that is going to be that itty bitty little shitty move right. to get you closer? Because Small hinges swing a big door. Little oh. changes over time are going to lead to the outcome that you want. Well, right. I, you know, I see little things, uh, for example, carbonated beverages. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you, they will blow you up. You really don't think about it. And then you look in the mirror, you're going to try to button that blouse and you're like, what? Your stomach. And then it takes two or three days uh, juicing. Mm -hmm. don't waste your produce get a juicer okay you've had the produce in there you know those carrots are kind of wilted the broccoli the, i put everything in mine if it's good washing it off i always have a little bit of baby baking soda and water or vinegar and water at the sink 
because I've got to wash off as much of those pesticides as I possibly can. Absolutely. And so that's very important too. A lot of people don't do that. They also um, don't check their bowels. Mm -hmm. If you use the poo and the whole neighborhood can smell it, something's wrong with you. And not only that, absolutely, this is so important. Checking your bowels. Yeah, checking it. You're supposed to poop every time you eat, really. But a good one every day or every two days. But there's a lot of women that I notice and I talk to that do not go consistently unless they're on their period. They go every other day, every three days. That's, absolutely. That's the change of hormones that helps. However, like you said there, they don't check their bowel habits. They don't know awareness, right? It's the tracking. The tracking builds awareness. Even if you just make a mental note to yourself, this is different. This doesn't usually happen because mm-hmm. when you stop noticing those things, it becomes the new norm. Right. And that's where we get lost when it becomes the new norm. And then you forget, oh, I just thought this was normal to feel like this. I just thought it was normal to not have energy. I just thought this was me, which is exactly the story that I got from the GP. Right. It's just you. It's your genetics. It's right, just, right. you're just, yeah, you're just going to be tall and thin, you know, the textbook answer. Talk to the young man. Talk to the young man that is struggling with weight issues too, because I'm telling you, they don't like the man boobs. Okay. They, you know, they get teased in school about that or they restrict food too. They always associate this most of the time. I'm making a general statement, brains don't get all bunched up, Uh, (laughs) but uh, towards women, you know, because it is the one thing that they know that they can control, but there are men that also struggle with this. Uh, Do you find just from your experience, and having, you know, clients that come through your facility, do you find that men have a tendency to be over or under or just depends? It depends. But what I really want to highlight to the brains listeners as well, that there is so much more to the story. I went on the anorexic kind of trajectory and then I changed and that being so uncomfortable in my own skin led me to getting breast implants and this is where the plot thickens. And- really? Okay, so yeah, so go back to that. So you you had itty bitties, and the, I remember you told me that. Girl, share that with us about them implants. Okay, so at the age of 21, when I felt that my relationship with food was healing, that I was more comfortable, I still wasn't happy, I still was unhappy and uncomfortable in my own body and I told mom look I want breast implants because they never grew they're not growing I probably stopped myself from growing by having the eating disorder and this is what I want and I've researched it and keep in mind April that I've been thinking about this since I was in year seven I've noticed it back then and I went under the knife for a two hour surgery, one and a half hour surgery. I got breast implants and I was happy. I was enjoying them for a few years. And this is where the plot thickens when I went to my GP and I said, something's wrong. I don't feel right. I have more anxiety. I now have high cholesterol. I am jaundice. My liver enzymes are deranged. I'm 22, 23 years old. I don't believe that this is meant to happen to a 23-year-old. What is going on? Doctor just kept saying, it's just you. It's just your genetics. I had arthritis, pain in my joints. It's just you. It's just genetics. I had an autoimmune disease, Raynaud's disease. My fingers would go completely numb in cold temperatures. It's just you. It's just your genetics. But what is actually controlling my genetics? What is switching this on? What is going on with my immune system? What's going on with those gut bugs? And this is what led me down the track of really questioning everything. And as I did more work on myself and as I explored more about health and wellness and understood more about the human body and energy and what we are actually made of and the fact that our body is just a host of bacteria, but also a host of all these chemical reactions 
So when you put breast implants into your body, which are silicone, doesn't matter if they're silicone or saline, saline also contains silicone, they all host toxins. You're putting bags of toxins into your body. Your body's going to naturally attack it straight away. Your immune system goes into overdrive and creates scar tissue around Ooh, the breast implant. Really? No, this is the stuff that they don't tell you, right? I walked in not knowing any of this. So it creates a sack around the breast implant of scar tissue because this is your immune system protecting you from the toxins. Mm. So after now six wait, and a half, let, me, let me throw in a little disclaimer. Was that what happened to you or is that pretty much what happened? That's what happens everywhere. April, that's what happens everywhere. If you put breast implants into your body, if you put any foreign object into your body, your immune system attacks it and creates scar tissue around it. This even happens with birth control. If you're using Implanon, putting it into your arm, your immune system is going to attack it and create scar tissue around it, which is why sometimes GPs can't find it to take it out. Hmm. Wow. Your immune system's natural response is to protect you. So I had two scar tissue sacs in my body. My immune system is in overdrive. It's working the whole time to protect me. And this is why all these other symptoms started to happen. It's wow. the way that my surgeon explained it, the surgeon that helped me explant. She said, it's like putting a tea bag in cold water. Eventually, you're going to get tea. For some women, it happens quicker. For me, it was gradual and then all of a sudden. It was gradual over six and a half years and it was the last kind of a half year that it just, I got inflamed, my face was puffy, I was in pain, I was confused, I had brain fog and I just kept complaining to my coaches because I have a fitness coach and I have an empowerment coach that I reach out. They're my mirrors. When you talk about mirror work, my coaches are my mirrors and I'm reflecting with them. I'm like, I just don't feel myself. Something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Something just doesn't feel right. So you go in and you get them removed. So as soon as I heard about breast implant illness and I did the research and I understood what my body had gone through, Four weeks later, I went under the knife again, an eight-hour surgery to take them out, much more costly than the initial surgery. And here's what I always want to remind people as well, brains, I really hope that you understand this. There's a time and a place for our traditional medicine. There's a time and a place for the surgeon to go in and cut, and that's what she did. I needed her to take those breast implants out so that my body could then heal. When she stitched me up and when I was able to go home the next day, that's when my healing journey began. And everything that I ate, every step that I took, every thought that I had and that I was feeding myself, not just nutrition, but also the thoughts that I was feeding myself right, exactly. in my healing process. And to this day, they talk about me. It's this Saturday, April is 12 months since my surgery. And wow. I am I am stronger physically and mentally now than I was before surgery. And now I let credit. Me, let me ask you a real transparent question. Tell me. Okay, so you go from a B to a D. I'm just saying. Now mm -hmm. you go back to the B and you stand there naked doing the mm -hmm. mirror work, mm -hmm. looking at yourself. Mm -hmm. do you say I am not a victim but a victor because look at me I survived do you look at the scar tissue do you look at where the breasts were and say you know I feel sometimes I'm in my feelings like I'm not as sexy or attractive what goes through your head now when you stand there in the mirror I love that question I want to go back and say I went from not even an A cup I had absolutely no tissue whatsoever no breast tissue went from no breast tissue to a D cup, double Ds. Oh, to now, for the big guns. <laughs> yeah, to now actually Dr. Eva, she is an artist and she was able to give me itty bitty titties that I didn't oh. have before, which is beautiful. And I do have massive scars and they're yeah. still healing. And I have 
I have that reminder of what I've put myself through and what my body has been through. And for me, the call that I made was right because I told myself the mother of my future children doesn't have breast implants and she does not go down the path of what society has been feeding our children in terms of the plastic surgery. Let me ask you another personal question because people want to know. Do your breasts have sensation? So they definitely, it takes time. They're regaining. So 12 months, pretty normal. It can take up to three years for all the neurons to refire and reconnect. So it it's quite a slow and it's a process. It's a process. So I had, and I, I'm really open and honest about it. And I write, I call myself a writer. This is how I reflect. And I shared a lot on my Instagram during this time. I lost it like four weeks after surgery when manual um, massages started to help with the scar tissue. And my therapist, when she started massaging, I just broke down in tears because I couldn't feel anything. I didn't feel like it was my body. It was very confronting. And at four weeks post-surgery, you start to question, am I healing? Is this happening? Is this working for me? What's going on? And this is where you have those conversations with yourself of what's the vision? Why did I do this? What brought me here to empower yourself in your choice and to step up to that challenge and keep going, which is again, reframing. What are you telling yourself? What are you feeding? What thoughts are you feeding yourself? It's not easy. It's not easy. No, it's not. And it's not meant to be easy, but what doesn't kill you makes you strong and you Absolutely. are so strong. Thank you so much for being on the show with us, Kathy, and sharing that information because that's what people want to know. I mean, now you talked about the breasts. Girl, I'm about to have one of these uh, sisters on the show from Atlanta to get the booty implants. Oh, yes, honey. We're going to talk about that because I knew some uh, somebody with the initials KK before the titties, the small waist and the hips. Okay. I know what that was looking like. And people forget you're going to get old, okay? Mm-hmm. And that stuff is going to get hard and it's going to sag. I mean, look at some of the most beautiful women, uh, Mrs. Presley, uh, you know, Joan Rivers. You know, you get addicted to it. You just can't get enough. It's another form of addiction. So look in the mirror and have that I am conversation. I am beautiful. I am wonderful. I am unique. I am special. I am on the edge with Kathy in April. That's where you are, Brains, the place where the conversation is pointed. Kathy, give us your information. Tell us how to get in contact with you. Brains, she's a point and a click away. She's young. She's hip. That smile. I'm telling you, you can't do anything but get hip and uh, to get hypnotized. And she knows what she's talking about. Yeah. So you can reach out to me via Instagram and Facebook. I have a presence, Kathy Ozakovic, Kathy O, and I'm here to help you heal. Well, brains, get busy. Get on it. Love, like, oops, turn the card around, share and subscribe. Leave a comment, ask a question, engage. You know, she's going to love that because that makes her sharper on her game. That makes me sharper on mine because I'm accountable. Because the next time she talks to me, she's going to say, April, did you just sell me a bill of goods? Or are you really, you know, 10, 15 pounds lighter? I'll be surprised. All right. Thanks so much. I thank you. Uh, Brains, go out and uh, watch what you consume mentally, physically, and spiritually. (laughs) Bye-bye.